Good evening. Welcome to our second Provs in the Path online Creativity is Contagious series. A few housekeeping rules just before we get started. Could I ask that all attendees turn their cameras off and remain muted for the duration of the talk? Thank you. If you do have any questions for Mark or Dave, please drop them into the chat box and we will get round to as many as we can at the end. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor David Hawkins, Executive Dean to the School of Digital Technologies and Arts. Hello there. <laughs> Always good to unmute first, isn't it, with these meetings? Very good. Um, look, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce, um, I think, what is a very exciting event, which is um, where Associate Professors Dave Paling and Mark Estevero are going to reflect on a turbulent 12 months in music and how artists, musicians and DJs have adapted their performance to audiences online and the socially distanced dance floor. Over to you. Thanks, David. OK, yeah, so I think that's where I can let me know any issues. Uh, thanks for coming along to today's talk uh, and the last minute changes in tech. Uh, I'm going to talk for the first 20 minutes or so and then Mark's going to take over and then we'll take any questions. Uh, so, yeah, I'll be looking at it's kind of a reflection on the last 12 months in the music industry, uh, identifying themes that keep recurring in different places and so on. Then Mark's looking at the development of music, music in context and online collaborations. Uh, so to start with some facts and figures, uh, these first thing to point out is these are from 2019, uh, a full year without COVID. So we're still waiting for the latest uh, figures. They should be out shortly, uh, but it's not necessarily about the figures uh, themselves, although they are quite significant, looking about six uh, billion gross value added to the uh, economy in the UK, uh, three, around three billion in exports. Uh, but then if you look at this bottom line here, music performing and visual arts, it's as much about the trend really. Uh, in 2010, about 6.3 billion pounds, uh, and then 2019, uh, over 10 billion. So that trajectory, that uh, increase is continuing. Similarly with music tourism. So as of 2019, going on for 5 billion pound contribution, again with an up upward trend, number of tourists increasing. Obviously, this is going to change significantly. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's it. I think it's interesting to see this upward trend, and hopefully that will come back at some point. Uh, one particular example: Glastonbury generates over 100 million into the uh, local economy every time it takes place. So it's a massive event uh, for everybody really in that area and the wider community. And for every 10 pound spent on a ticket for a live event, around 17 pound goes back into the local economy. So everybody benefits from these activities. Uh, things we do know about the impacts. Uh, these are figures coming in from various places. 85% uh, of live revenue lost. And since March 2019, many performers have seen their income reduced to zero, as you would expect. And then to compound that, uh, the performers income skews heavily towards live, obviously. Uh, it's not just the performance fees, uh, it's also about selling merchandise and physical products at the gigs themselves. So it's a massive impact not to be able to play live. And grassroots music venues seen this fall, 75% fall in income, so about three quarters of the year for 2019. Uh, UK Music is working with the government. This is a UK Music's an umbrella organisation uh, representing 
the music industry. Uh, very recently published this uh, article trying to get things back on track for the summer of 2021. So things are still, uh, we hope they're going to be happening. Some things have been cancelled, uh, but they are suggesting this uh, announcement to the hands face space approach, which they're calling test, clean, prevent. Uh, to put the focus on the venues rather than the punters uh, and to make sure everything's clean and safe. So they're asking the government for uh, government-backed insurance, extension of VAT on tickets and so on to, to hopefully get things moving again. Uh, on the upside, I suppose, uh, is growth in physical sales. So uh, this is another thing that's been continuing. Vinyl and ca uh, surprisingly cassette sales have, have surged during lockdown. So about 5 million LPs purchased in the UK over the last 12 months. So I think people want to support the artists and not able to go and see them, uh, but they can still uh, consume music, experience music, support the artists, uh, even though they're not going to uh, be able to see them. Similarly, streaming subscriptions have increased. So these are entertainment retailers figures uh, looking at entertainment channels like Disney and Netflix. Uh, but music streaming services like Spotify and so on, they've also seen an increase in subscriptions. Part of this uh, talk uh, a couple of months ago, I, I distributed this survey actually to get response of musicians to get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, about how they uh, coped during the last 12 months. Uh, got quite a good response, uh, emerging themes such as people using new technologies, taking on more collaborations, many of these things will come back uh, later in the talk, uh, producing at home and so on. Uh, this was answered mostly by uh, band members and solo artists, but it's kind of across the range, uh, composers, DJs, producers and so on. A few, uh, just go through a few of the responses. Uh, so firstly, the negative impacts. Uh, I think these word clouds visualize the responses quite well, actually. It's fairly straightforward what's happening here. The cancellation of gigs 2020, uh, lack of practicing, lack of income, and so on. Uh, studio access, not being able to meet up to rehearse, and so on. Uh, the couple of positive things to reflect back, new ways of working. So the obvious one is streaming, many pe many more people taking on streaming, uh, but also uh, trying on new things, not necessarily music related as well. So one person here is saying they're going to care of work, but others adapting their music uh, capabilities, offering uh, guitar lessons, recovery, uh, remote mixing and mastering and so on. So they're developing new skills uh, and using them creatively and maintaining some kind of income stream. Other well, positive things, uh, another obvious one maybe, uh, people using time more creatively, uh, more time to rehearse alone, develop instrumental skills. So using this time uh, in a constructive way uh, to enhance their skills. Uh, writing new stuff. Uh, again, collaborations keeps cropping up and I know Mark will say more about that in later slides. So I think this shows both sides really. The, the big one is obvious lack of income, but also musicians as ever being creative, looking at ways to supplement their income, getting prepared for when things uh, sort themselves out and hopefully people will be ready and raring to go once the pandemic is uh, very on the wane. So uh, I also work on uh, the editorial team for this journal called Dance Cult, Journal of Electronic Dance Music Culture. And in November 2020, they released uh, an issue which was all about, or one section anyway, there was a section that I'm the editor for, was all about the effects of the pandemic on the dance community. 
So one thing about dance culture, dance communities, it it's, uh, relies very heavily on the shared communal experiences. And I know you could say the same about concert experiences in general and festivals. But dance culture, dance events, it's all about the crowd. I think the emphasis moves away from the DJ and the performer and the the audience. I don't think you can really call them the audience. They they are actually part of the event. They make the event itself as much as the music that's playing. And similar themes emerging here. So uh, the DIY ethos, people having to work from home, uh, use their own kit, uh, still getting music out there in various ways, financial implications and so on. So the pandemic has forced this rapid digital migration. This is something that was happening anyway. People are using online means for various things uh, across the board. Really, it's not just for music, music consumption, entertainment, communications in general. And um, more and more people using mobile devices, computer, uh, virtual networks for communication. But this was. Uh, last March, it was basically, that's the only way you can do something now. So it was forced upon us very rapidly. Uh, asked to hear in his articles, uh, kind of wary, a little bit wary of this. Uh, I'll, I'll read his quote here. With so much of our lives already experienced through laptops and phone screens, the physicality of clubs can constitute a vital manifestation of other space. And we should be wary the acceleration of live, live streaming is never allowed to normalize any further in incorporation of club culture into a flattened technological sameness. So it's this uh, acceptance that people are migrating to online uh, consumption, but also the desire for that not to end up being the only means of consuming this and the hope that club culture will continue afterwards and yeah like I say this applies to much of the music industry and uh, events also services such as boiler room they this is a service that's been going since 2010 they been in the live streaming game for a long time really they've got a massive archive mostly of uh, DJ performances, club nights, where the, the DJ is the centre of attention. For the, the, the short video clip I'm about to show you is either side of the, the lockdown. So the first one's towards the end of Feb from a club in Dublin. And then afterwards, uh, after that, they uh, got their artists to stream from, from their own spaces. So I'll just play, it's only about 30 seconds long. Yeah, so that's an interesting snapshot, like say so either side of the lockdown that really highlights this point of the the lack of community that's happened since the lockdown, but also the transition to online and the DIY approach to stuff. The the upside of it is uh, in the second clip, you see he's got access to much more equipment and he can make it more of a performance uh, in real time using various pieces of kit. And it demonstrates that willingness to continue to their practice and to share a musician wants people to hear what they're working on. There is also, uh, we're experiencing the pandemic from an enforced local perspective. I'm sure most of us are keeping an eye on the news. 
um, the global perspective, but we're still isolated in the UK or wherever you're listening from, uh, I should say. But our experiences do mirror those across the globe. Uh, India is one example here with an extraordinarily diverse electronic music scene. I'm sure it has a diverse music scene in general. Uh, they've uh, a number of producers from different cities uh, taking on streaming and sharing their creative processes. So it's not just about the performance and transmitting it to uh, consumers, it's about sharing techniques and ideas, and they've seen this as a leveling of the playing field, independent from the hierarchies of pre-COVID-19 music scene. And this, uh, another short video clip, it's just one example. Instagram seems to be very big in India, actually, for artists sharing uh, works in progress short video clips. And this is just one example where somebody's uh, grabbed uh, a local meme. So there was uh, a video of a politician chanting Go Corona Go, which became quite controversial uh, in India. Uh, many people adapted this creatively, and this is one example. So something really relevant to the moment and showing the adaptation, the use of social media streaming, direct access to fans and so on. Creativity then and how that applies to lockdowns. Uh, at the minute, constraints are unavoidable. Uh, lockdowns means latency. Again, another theme Mark's going to pick up on. Um, means lack of rehearsals uh, in the shared space, lack of access to equipment. The patent here, paper only last year actually, uh, demonstrated how limitations can enhance creativity. And it's finding the balance really uh, of uh, performance and arousal levels. So if you think of this about constraints, there can be too many constraints making it difficult to be creative, such as the inability to work with others, lack of access to space, lack of access to equipment and so on. And you, you're kind of stuck. There's not a lot you can do with these very severe limitations. But the other extreme is a lot of people have migrated to making music on computers because they've not got access to their regular studio space. Um, list of kit, but the computer basically means the options are endless and it can be difficult to get started really, that you spend a lot of time figuring out what certain things do. So it's finding that sweet spot really of, uh, I think you, you have a certain amount of equipment, you get to know it very well, you stretch it to its extremes and you can be much more creative with it. Uh, so in some ways, the, the, these limitations of lockdown has contributed to that, but at the same time, it's, it's uh, made some things more difficult as well. And then it also brings up issues related to liveness. Currently, live events are consumed via streaming services, and Sandham would say we're, we're very much in the realm of virtual liveness, and his opinion is that uh, virtual liveness depends on the perception of liveness. So you, the, the artist streaming a performance can really subvert that process. It could be a pre-recorded performance and nobody would necessarily know the difference if the person is still in the chat and reacting with the audience. But it does boil down to uh, the, the perception. So if you perceive it's live, then for all intents and purposes, it is live. 
um, in a culture where many people constantly perform their digital selves on the internet, concepts of live performance can also include the use of the same technologies. So there is much more acceptance of live over streaming virtual services. But also, why do people cherish the live? Why do we want to go on live? various reasons you know, one of them possibly exclusivity so an act or an event might only be taking place a few times during the year the band has a tour with limited venues limited ticket sales and so on rob marsden broke this up uh, in his talk last month about spontaneity uncertainty the risk that's involved in a live performance sometimes it's as much about the time between the music, the discussion between the audience and the performers as it is about the music itself. And then we're all out there for escapism, being present in the moment, connecting with like-minded people. Uh, virtual reality, I think this is uh, increasingly taking off. There are online nightclubs, uh, lack of you, sorry, Simao and uh, Guerra pointed out a few limitations here. So the lack of human warmth, lack of direct interaction between pairs, lack of movement and dance ritual, lack of multisensory experience. But on the positive side, the people that do uh, experience these events are often connected more in the physical world as well. So they continue the relationships afterwards. And the feeling of belonging and empathy between the members is evident. Very of the time. So I'm just this is my last slide, just going to finish up. So I think live streaming is currently an audio visual experience mediated by screen and audio technologies. There is that loss of physical connection. It's uh, the mediatization. There are downsides which I've not really touched on, such as the uh, quality of your home equipment. So however good the stream is from the artist, a person might be experiencing it over a very poor connection and also on a very primitive uh, phone with poor sound quality and so on. People still want the real experience and musicians are prepared. And well, I've said here, at the end, the summer is waiting and we will all be seeking this release valve. So thanks for listening. I'm just going to pass over to Mark. I can answer questions afterwards. Thank you. There we go. Thank you very much, Dave. Hopefully you can all hear me. Let me just um, see if I have control of the slides. Here we go. Um, so, for my part of the talk, uh, I'm going to begin by considering how our relationship with music has developed to the point where we are today. Then I'm going to briefly consider the importance of context and place on our experience of music and what happens when we reframe sounds in different environments. I'm going to illustrate this with some examples from the visual arts. I'm going to follow this with a quick discussion on the nature of live events so that we can think about what's lost and what's gained when live music moves online. And next, we'll consider ways in which we interact with new technologies, as this should help us to understand our developing relationships with live streaming and online collaborations. And then finally, I'll show you some platforms for high quality audio sharing and play you a few brief examples. So to begin then, I'd like to take a step back for a minute and consider briefly uh, how we got to where we are. Music's always played an important role in societies. The earliest known musical instrument, a fragment of a flute made from bone, dates back at least 40,000 years, and presumably Homo sapiens was making music long before that. But how has our relationship to music changed over time? Has the internet had a significant effect on our relationship to music? Or is it just another medium through which we encounter music? The musicologist Simon Frith talked about three stages of music in society, 
the folk stage, the art stage and the pop stage. So in the folk stage, music is not written down or recorded in any way. Music is stored in the collective memory and in musical instruments. Music is used for ritual or ceremonial purposes, but it's also very much integrated into everyday social practices through things like work songs, lullabies, and so on. Then comes the art stage. Now music is notated or codified in some way. Our standard Western notation has its earliest beginnings in the monasteries of Europe, possibly as early as the ninth century. But many other cultures have also developed systems for codifying music, going back at least as far as the Babylonians in about uh, 1400 BC. So as soon as you write music down, it begins to take on a kind of imaginary, idealized existence. It starts to become detached from our everyday experiences. Performances can now be measured against some sort of idealized performance. And the mind becomes more important than the body. And music itself now has the potential to become a transcendental experience. But music still has to be performed in real time. There's still no other way of retrieving music. Finally, in Frith's account, we reach the pop stage. The defining feature of the pop stage is the ability to record sound. As soon as we can do this, the material existence of music is transformed. And now music can be heard anywhere. Previous barriers of time and space disappear and music has truly become a commodity. Not sheet music or performance fees, but the actual music itself has been commodified. Of course, when we listen to recorded music, we're engaging with a series of contradictions. We're reliving the past in the present moment. We can have very private experiences with very public artifacts. And we're experiencing something intimate, but also universal. And we're experiencing something deeply authentic and yet wholly artificial. So let's come back to our theme for this evening. Where do online collaborations and live streaming fit into this model? Is it just an extension of the pop stage? Or is this something new? To get some insight into this, let's consider live music for a moment and think about what it is that makes it so special. Let's start by thinking about the spaces in which live music is performed. The first thing to note is that environments hold memories, by which I mean that there are associations, expectations and patterns of behaviour connected to different spaces. The pictures on this side are from the Barbican in London, a frequent venue for classical music concerts, and the Hammersmith Apollo, a classic rock music venue. Performing the same piece of music in each space will change the reception of that piece. And if you were to stream the piece online, you would once again change its meaning. This connection between music, space and context is worth exploring further. It's easy to illustrate the importance of environment if we look at some examples from architecture. It's easy to see in these two images that there's an intimate relationship between a building and its environment. Light, colour, space and environment all create a complicated web of interrelationships which help to create the meaning of the buildings, transforming the buildings in the best cases into works of art. If you change the context of the building, you change its meaning. Sound behaves in a similar way. As soon as you put a sound into a different context, you change the sound. To illustrate this further, let's listen to a brief extract from a track called Honey on Moby's play album from way back in 1999. Moby expected play to be his final album, 
His previous album had been a relative failure for the time, selling only 250,000 copies. Play would eventually sell more than 10 million copies. And much more importantly, it would be licensed for use in films, television shows and commercials in ways which pointed towards new rev revenue streams uh, for a new age and a changing industry. Here's a little excerpt from uh, the Moby song. Yeah, my honey come back sometime I'm on a red back jack sometime I get a hump in my back sometime I'm going over here sometime I'm gonna get my pal sometime we down on sometime that was actually the um the second one that was the sample that it came from this yeah, should be oh, hang on a second try again this is the Moby one yeah, So that was Moby, and before that we heard um, the sample featured in the Moby song, which was recorded in 1960 by Alan Lomax and appeared on an LP called The Sounds of the South, a musical journey from the Georgia Sea Islands to the Mississippi Delta. The singer was Bessie Jones, who was born in Smithville, Georgia in 1902 and who came to see herself as a carrier and a documenter of folklore and tradition, as well as a teacher. An enormous part of the success of Moby's play, let me just move on to the next slide, there we go. An enormous part of the success of Moby's play was its very prominent use of Alan Lomax's recordings. Deals were signed and money was eventually paid to various publishers, but the intentions and the wishes of the original artists or their heirs were not considered. The point we're making here is that by reframing the original piece, by changing its context, the meaning of the work has been changed absolutely. Meanings and intentions can be changed in ways which may be subtle and unanticipated. To illustrate this, here are a few more examples from the visual arts. In Tracy Emin's famous installation, My Bed, the act of repositioning the bed from a bedroom to an art gallery changes its purpose absolutely from a functional object to a work of art. Another example. Here we see a famous photograph from 1981 taken by Sherry Levine, off another photograph taken by Walker Evans in the 1930s. The original is an iconic image of sharecropper's wife, Ali Mae Burroughs, taken in depression era America, and which has a wide audience and deep cultural resonances. Evans' original photograph was presumably intended as a document of the plight of sharecropping farmers during the Great Depression. But by photographing an already existing photograph, Sherry Levine changes the context and the meaning absolutely. Now, the image becomes a statement on ownership appropriation, exploitation, and so on. Another well-known example is Richard Prince's Cowboy series, in which he photographed photographs of the Marlboro Man advertising series and presented them as his own work. The original images were taken by different photographers working for commission and were intended to reinforce the brand identity of Marlboro presenting an image of American authenticity and masculinity and reinforcing myths and stereotypes of the American West. Prince's repositioning challenges narratives of authenticity and ownership and reveals underlying falsehoods in the cultural iconography, all through the act of presenting the work in a different context. As a final example, Here's a photograph which I took a couple of years ago of a work by Paul Stevenson, which I saw in the window of a commercial art gallery in Cambridge. Paul Stevenson has recreated works by Andy Warhol using the original techniques as closely as possible. As Warhol himself used assistance in his work, the question is, to what extent is this work by Andy Warhol? 
What we're seeing here is my presumably worthless photograph of Stevenson's recontextualizing of a screen print by Andy Warhol or by assistance of Andy Warhol of a photograph of Mao, which originally appeared on the Little Red Book in 1966. At each stage of the repositioning, there is a change in purpose and a change in meaning. So, back to music. Hopefully the previous examples uh, demonstrate how presenting works in different contexts changes their meanings, often in subtle and unexpected ways. Here's a short example from a work by Canadian composer and sound ecologist Hildegard Vesterkamp, in which she reframes environmental sounds in order to explore the relationships between soundscapes and musical instruments. Natural sounds are juxtaposed with instrumental sounds to form a play on memory and reminiscence and comment on acoustic ecology. So, now that we've established the importance of place and context with music, let's return to the idea of live streaming and online collaborations. Let's now consider live music, live interactions, and think about what may be lost and what may be gained when music moves online. Here we have a very short list of possible settings for live music classical concert, jazz club, rock concert, open mic, and so on. And on the right of the slide, I've listed a range of possible attributes for the settings. So a classical concert at the Barbican, for example, would consist of professional musicians playing essentially acoustic music in a large formal setting. The whole experience would have a fairly complicated funding model consisting of ticket sales, merchandising, possibly even some funding from public bodies as well. An open mic would be an amateur musicians playing in an informal setting for free and so on. I'm sure you can think of your own connections uh, for the others. In all of these live events, however, there will be a complicated web of interactions taking place. There will be a dialogue taking place between the musicians and the audience a two-way dialogue, it's important to note, even in the most formal of classical concerts. The musicians themselves will be reacting to each other, to the audience, to the room, and to the conventions of the occasion, and adapting their performance to the environment around them. A live performance is a ritualized acting out of social conventions, a communicative performance which reinforces social identity and cohesion. Different interest groups will have their own standards of behaviour, each as codified as the other. A metal concert will have standards and expectations of dress and behaviour as rigorous as an opera. An audience will understand the conventions of the event and use these to interpret any meaning. A final point about live events is that whether we're talking about the freest of free improvisations or the most carefully rehearsed performance, something is happening which is at once curated, organized and staged, while being at the same time, paradoxically, spontaneous, unique to that moment and unique to that place. So, when we experience a live music event, we're experiencing something that involves movement, body language and visual cues, conventions of dress and conventions of place, all play an important role and we're all experiencing also an event which relies on the audience's ability to interpret these conventions and to understand the expectations of the event and how these may be subverted or fulfilled to effect. We're also probably experiencing an event with some sort of model for funding or monetization. It would seem then that if we move all this online either in terms of musicians interacting with an audience or musicians interacting with each other, something inevitable, inevitably will be lost. There will be no direct visual and oral feedback. 
there will certainly not be a shared acoustic space. There will be no immediate communication not mediated through technology. It would seem, therefore, that live streaming and online collaborations are a pretty, a pretty poor substitute for the real thing. If we think like this, however, we're falling into the trap of equating the two experiences. Live streaming and online collaborations are not poor substitutes for face-to-face -face experience. They're completely different experiences. As soon as we start to see things like this, then many of the disadvantages associated with live streaming and online collaborations can be presented positively. Inevitably, when people discuss the experience of collaborating online, there is an obsession with latency, the time lag that exists between playing a musical event and the reception of that event, which makes highly rhythmic and synchronized music extremely challenging to perform in real time online collaborations. But what if we were to embrace the latency rather than fight against it? What if we were to write our music and design our performances in such a way that latency ceased to be an issue? Another issue with live music is that apart from the most established of artists, there's a relatively small audience size. But this could be seen instead as an opportunity to grow your audience into a potentially huge community. It's important to remember as well that most people listen to live streams after the event, not in real time. And what about the lack of immediate direct feedback from a live audience? Well, there is feedback for live streamed events, albeit of a qualitatively different type in the form of the comments section. Engaging positively with these new forms of feedback is resulting in new models of audience artist interactions. Also, social media platforms like Facebook can attract people who would never consider going to a contemporary music, contemporary classical music context, for example. So it's a great way to reach new audiences. Audiences online can listen passively. They can dip in and out. There is a detached relationship which allows them to stumble across the music and to encounter it in a much more neutral and unthreatening setting. The fear of being trapped in a room, listening to music you don't understand or enjoy, puts many people off experiencing new types of music. Music is an art form that unfolds over time. In this sense, it's a very different experience from visiting a modern art exhibition where you're free to spend as much or as little time as you like in front of each painting. Live streaming is, of course, a great way for artists to keep in touch with their existing audiences as well. We've become used to computers being fast and perfect. We expect and rely upon our phones and tablets and smart TVs to work seamlessly. And most of us do not spend much time worrying about the underlying technology that makes it all possible. Using computers for live streaming is a reminder of the pioneering days from recent decades when computers and their associated software were much less well-developed and we were forced to engage with the technology and to think creatively in order to get the best out of it. Embracing chaos is part of the nature of music, and this can be creatively very stimulating. Being able to extemporize, to improvise when things do not go to plan, has always been an important skill for musicians. And dealing with the limitations of live streaming and online collaborations only reinforces this important ability. If we step back for a minute and consider the ways in which people interact with new technologies, we can see that we're at a very interesting time. Technologies develop when people find different uses for existing systems, what the philosopher Don Ida calls multi-stable variations. We're not always open to new technologies, however, we may be heavily invested in old systems. We have, may have spent a considerable amount of time, money and effort acquiring skills which a new technology would make redundant. We may find it challenging to let go of habitualized models, workflows, skill sets and practices for many legitimate reasons. But 
it would seem that we're at a very interesting point in this cycle where new technologies emerge. The last year has forced huge numbers of us to engage with live interactions online. As we emerge from the lockdown, our lives uh, and as our lives begin to become less restricted, it's unlikely that everything will revert back to the way it was in early 2020. Millions of people have been drawn into an online world of meetings and collaborations during the pandemic. That isn't going to change even as the situation returns to some kind of normality. Musicians may be expected to perform online concerts. Concerts may become increasingly hybrid mixtures of live in the room experiences and online collaborations. Live shows which incorporate remote participation will become increasingly common. And it's important that we see these changes as opportunities and not as barriers. Finally, here are some systems which have been designed to allow the real time sharing of high quality audio. Uh, the one I've been experimenting there is the one called Sonobus in the top right. And here are a couple of examples uh, of some online collaborations. The first one is a collaboration between Mike McInerney, who's uh, based down in Plymouth, and Duncan Chapman, who's based in Lincolnshire. So Mike uh, produces sounds on his modular synth in this case, uh, and Duncan processes them in real time. This is just a 30 second clip of a, a longer piece. And here is a collaboration called Wild, uh, using a, I think it's the Wildcat uh, electronic instrument. And it's a collaboration between composer Sora Budeman, who's based just up the road here in Kiel, and who incidentally is going to be one of our keynote speakers at our noise floor event in May. And um, he's working here with a percussionist called Lee Ferguson, who is based in Strasbourg. Let's have a quick listen to this. There we are. Again, that's an excerpt from a much longer piece. So it's clear then that technology affects the ways in which we listen to and value music. We can see uh, online music, live online music transcends time and space and breaks connections between the physical instruments, uh, the performance and the space. It also suggests new forms of behavior and encourages new social conventions. Live online music is qualitatively different from other forms of music interaction. It changes the reception of the sounds and the associations we have with those sounds in ways which we may not have predicted. It's an exciting time and I think we should embrace it. Uh, excellent, thank you very much. Thank you to uh, both Dave and Mark there for that presentation. Uh, we do have a few minutes if anyone does have any questions. You can type them into the chat or if you'd like to um, unmute yourself and perhaps we can get a bit of a conversation going. Or put your hand up, yeah. Dina, is it? Do you want to ask a question? Diana. Diana, sorry. 
in the future of music, the competition, the online streaming services have gotten to get a bit popular during COVID. Yeah. It's starting to get a lot more uh, frequent during the coronavirus pandemic and everybody has been making some virtual concerts and festivals into artists and bands. Yeah, Dave and Mark, do you have any thoughts on Deanna's uh, thoughts there? Dave, do you have anything to say about online streaming? I'm sorry, I, I, I missed some of that actually. I miss the last. I think the, day I think I the question the question is about um, more and more people uh, kind of collaborating online, online streaming, so uh, online, uh, you know, homemade concerts and things like that becoming. I, th I think that's absolutely the case, isn't it? I think more and more people have been doing that. Professional people have been doing that. Amateurs have been doing that. Uh, and it's yeah, not really it's, reckon everybody's been doing it on their own or with other people. I personally feel like I'm on my own here without no support because I don't feel like I'm a, a lonely person who's doing music all the time for myself and not for other artists because I feel isolated in this world without no one to collaborate with. I think the internet is a great opportunity to, to, you know, to for people who may be isolated to to reach out or to be reached out to and to um, uh, start communicating. You know, if you if you want to get in touch with us afterwards, I'm sure we can put you in touch with people that that would be willing to you know share music and share ideas. I think that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Um. Holly Smith has a question for Dave, please. Um, I'll read it out. It's in the chat. I see that the government will be undertaking trials for the reopening of nightclubs and music venues over the next few months, which is fantastic news that these venues are being given consideration. Even pre-pandemic, music venues and club closures have been devastatingly rife in the UK over the past decade. And now 80% of clubs are expected not to survive beyond March without government support. For frequenters of these venues, what can we do to help preserve these safe spaces of culture, community and freedom? Yeah, thanks for that, Holly. It, it's a tough one, really. I think it is. Uh, there are moves to, like you say, uh, government given a date for these places to open, looking at testing regimes and so on, so they can open safely. I, uh, but inevitably, places are closing. Uh, people just can't afford to keep them going, um, however good the intentions are. And I think ultimately it does come down to the, the audience and the punter, the people frequenting these places to support them in whatever way possible. And there are places that have uh, fundraising activities, uh, just asking more people to contribute really to, to enable them to continue into the future and when they do open people need to get in there and support them to their best capabilities and I'm sure that, like I said in the presentation people are going to be desperate to go out and uh, I am reasonably confident that places will re-emerge uh, just because people want that and uh, it, there's, I think there'll be a bit of an explosion which will settle down <laughs> again at some point. But yeah, I am reasonably confident uh, and it's all about supporting them as, as best you can. Thank you. And I think that just um, answers Angela's question um, that she's asked there. Um, and just to the statement that she said, we're all desperate to hear live music despite the success of online music events. I think somebody uh, did have the hand up. Mike, if you're there. Yes. Hello. I mean, thank you, Mark and Dave. Um, and it's really, really interesting. Um, this isn't so much a question, it's more an observation. Uh, having had to find ways to collaborate with my fellow musicians who I rehearsed regularly with, a three-piece kind of jazz trio, um, we discovered in the end Jam Kazam and Soundjack and started to do work online. Um, 
um, which led actually to doing new things rather than just rehearsing old things. But also, it's strange, you've reached that point now where it's wondering whether the experience of doing this online, when we do ambient music in a room again, is going to be different. We think it's actually going to be quite different. <laughs> I think I think it's definitely going to change the way that we, you know, play music. I am currently working on a composition uh, uh, with David Cotter, who I think is I saw him in the audience list just now. And for the composition, we're we're using latency, and we're working with it rather than working against it, which I would never have considered doing a year ago. No, we had that problem first of all was. Uh using a metronome and thinking, this isn't working. <laughs> yeah, abs abs as, as soon as you start doing something with a metronome, you're doomed. But as soon as you put the metronome to one side and, and think differently, yeah, then, then exactly all, so all sorts of things open up. That's and um, yeah, that's, de that's definitely going to change things. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Um, What's your opinion on might live in-person events include um, an extra online audience or collaborations in future? So sort of blended, I guess, going forward. I think that's already happening. I think I think there's yeah. there's much more kind of online audience participation to the to the point where the audience and the performer is starting to break down a little bit in certain contexts. I think. Um, I think that's that's definitely a good thing, and it's definitely happening. Not in every situation, but but certainly in a lot of genres. Okay, a, a question from Corolla. From my experience, but I did not do a survey. There was the notion that audience overall embraced the increased accessibility, but performers overall felt restricted and felt the lack of live togetherness during live performances. So audience expectations might have changed for the future, even out of lockdown, any thoughts? Um, yeah. Dave. Yeah, I think uh, you're right, Carola. Uh, I, I see it as a teacher as well. It's not just in music that uh, we we expected the pandemic and lockdowns and online delivery to be quite detrimental, but in a lot of cases, it's actually proved to be a positive, where people don't have to be in the same space with other people. They're less afraid to ask questions, maybe, and they can access the materials afterwards and come back to it. Uh, kind of Mark was pointing this out about being able to dip in and out uh, into various concerts and not feel threatened. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers all your question, Carol. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, but, but you're right. From a performance perspective, the, that lack of connection, particularly if you're a band member rather than a solo performer, is is quite detrimental. I think you just don't. You need to be in a room with somebody to have that one-to-one -one kind of sharing of ideas and real-time generation of something that's really exciting. I think. Okay, uh, unless anyone's got any other questions. Um, I'd just like to thank you both for that, um, our second promise in the path. Uh, we do have a third one in this series on April the 12th, so do check out our events pages at staffs.ac.uk forward slash events. And thank you all for attending. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you.